The Lord is risen. Hallelujah. The Lord says, come, let anyone who wishes to take the water of life as a gift, trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sins. Almighty God, in raising Jesus from the grave, you shattered the power of sin and death. We confess that we remain captive to doubt and fear. Bound in the ways that lead us to death, we overlook the poor and the hungry and pass by those who mourn. We are deaf to the cries of the oppressed and indifferent to calls for peace. We despise the weak and abuse the earth you made. Forgive us, God of mercy. Help us to trust your power to change the lives and make us new that we may know the joy of life abundant given in Jesus Christ, the risen Lord.
Hear the good news then in God's promise. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Now let us greet each other with the sign of peace. Peace be with you all. Peace, everyone. Peace be with you all. Hello, peace be unto everybody. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship at Westminster Presbyterian Church. It's very, very, very good to be with you here this morning. You came here knowing that this is not an air conditioned room. That was an act of faith, perhaps even a, declar a defiant declaration in the face of uh, heat that uh, this is important to you. And I hear that and it matters and I appreciate it. Welcome to Margaret, who's been in the hospital this week and here you are. Here you are, two feet, welcome, so good to see you. So good to have you here. And welcome to uh, Rob Trawick who is our, uh, uh, our guest preacher this morning. We'll hear more from Rob in just a few moments. Rob is um, the newly elected, and you haven't even quite started work yet, as the general presbyter of the Albany Presbytery, which is a position that has been vacant for some number of years. So since I have only been a Presbyterian for two years myself, you are my favorite general presbyter. <laughs> Uh, I'm really looking forward to getting to know you better. Uh, Rob, as General Presbyter, is um, is a leader, a facilitator, and uh, an encourager, and an enabler, and an, a, a supporter uh, to this congregation and to all of the congregations of the Albany Presbytery with whom we jointly serve and jointly declare the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What a, a privilege to have you here with us this morning. You know, when I say welcome on these mornings, I welcome not only those of you who are here in person, and of course, welcome those of you who are here on Zoom this morning, but I also welcome all that has happened this week, which is to say all that we bring with us into this room. And sometimes we bring you know, delight and celebration. And often that's right there in the mix of grief and loss, and even sometimes just, let's say it, despair. And it has been a hard few weeks uh, for our country. We passed that horrible milestone of a million deaths from COVID-19. We've heard very disturbing news for the Supreme Court. The midterm, uh, the recent primary elections reminded us that things that we have taken for granted in this country, including the validity of fair elections, are things that are now questioned, things that we cannot for sure guarantee will continue into the future. This is, this is disturbing upsetting, unnerving, unmooring, and then add to that the recent news of the shooting in Buffalo. That shooting had happened when we gathered for worship 
last Sunday and um, Gail raised it as a prayer concern and we did pray for the people of Buffalo, but I don't know about for you, but it took for me a few days for the real, the news of what happened there to really sink in. To sink in. To know that there was an 18 year old in this state who for a year plotted and planned an attack on unarmed black people who were shopping for groceries in Buffalo. They managed to kill 10 people. What, what to do with that? What to do as we understand and hear and allow it to really enter into our consciousness that someone in community very similar to this one can harbor that kind of hate and not just in a sudden irrational act, but as a planful, thoughtful, premeditated act. Execute that kind of violence. What to do with that? It's, it's enough to make us despair. What are we to do? <laughs> what are we to do? And yet, you came here this morning you came in person, you came on Zoom, you showed up here. Now, you might have come because you said you'd sing in the choir this morning, or you might have come because you promised to preach here this morning, or because you're paid to play the organ, or you signed up as an usher, or you're uh, the tech support for the morning. You might have come out of habit or to see a friend, and it might not have occurred to you that by coming here, this isn't a declaration of hope in the face of despair. But it is. It is because this community is a community that's centered around a very bold statement. And that statement is that God hasn't given up on the world, but that in fact, in places of despair and loss, that is the place where God shows up with new life and promise. It's hard to sometimes see that. It can be hard to sometimes declare that, but that's what we are here to do. And we do it in the context of a multicultural community, which is a bold thing to do. And it is in fact, a way to respond, at least one of the ways in which we respond to the news of this week, to the news of last week, to the news of our lives. It's a way in which we don't just hear the declaration of hope, but make that declaration ourselves with our words, with our bodies, and with our actions. So thank you for being here. Thank you for helping me remember that there is so much still that is good and that there is reasons not to despair. And if you need another reason not to despair, let's hear a word from our kids. Lily, can you come up? And I know Belinda's going to help, and we're going to just talk about for a minute about what's happening directly after worship, which will give you a sense of anticipation and excitement. I know. Jasmine, are you here? You are. Why don't you come up too? Because you're going to go to camp and come on up and we're going to celebrate that with you. Good morning, everybody. Um, so today is the day. We are having a lemonade stand to raise funds for our children who are going to summer camp this year. Um, we have five children signed up to go to Camp Wawa. 
And out of the five, three have never been to camp. So this is very exciting for us. And those who were in church last week, you heard Robert talk of his experiences, you know, when he used to go to camp. And we would like all our children to have the same experiences. So today we are gonna have a lemonade stand outside, right in front of the church when church closes. And to all those who have already donated, thank you so much. Those who are yet to donate, thank you. And we'll be looking forward to your donations. And today is a perfect day to have a cup of lemonade, cold lemonade. So please stop by. And those on Zoom, we are gonna be here till two o'clock. So you can drive by and get a cup of lemonade. Thank you. And baked goods. Thank you all so much, everyone. And we'll have, we'll have eight Westminster kids in that one session all at camp at the same time. So we're gonna have our own little crew um, if you count in my, my three kids. So we're very excited and we'll see you all after with cold beverage. Let's see the signs. So how much is lemonade? One dollar. Well, now that's a deal. <laughs> that is a deal right there. And what about a cookie? How much is a cookie? One dollar. So I could get a cookie and a lemonade for what? Two dollars. Oh, this is a deal. Thank you so much for doing that, for uh, offering that to us. And um, it's going to make sure that our preacher doesn't preach too long because we're all going to be thinking about the lemonade. Okay. Thank you. And we'll see you outside after worship. Thanks.
Oscar, who is our the littlest camper we saw down there, gave me this rock this morning as we met in the parking lot. I think he knew I might need it to get through all these readings, but if you would pray with me. Living God, with joy we celebrate the presence of your word, your, your risen word. <clears throat> Enliven our hearts by your Holy Spirit, that we may proclaim the good news of eternal and abundant life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A reading from the book of Acts, uh, chapter 16, verses 9 through 15. During the night, Paul had a vision. There stood a man of Macedonia, pleading with him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. When he had seen this vision, we immediately tried to cross over to Macedonia, being convinced that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them. We set sail from Troas and took a straight course to Samothrace and, following, and the following day to Neapolis and from there to Philippi, which is the leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. And we remained in this city for several days. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gates of, to the river, by the river, where we supposed that there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had gathered there. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, listened to us. She was from the city of Tyaria, and, and a dealer in purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what we had, what was said by Paul. When she and her household were baptized, she urged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my home. And she prevailed upon us. Our second reading today is from the book of Revelations, chapter 21, verse 10, chapter 22, verses 22 to, 20, uh, to, to 5. And in the spirit, he carried, us, he carried us away to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down from heaven, out of heaven from God. I saw no temple in the city, for its temple, its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty and the Lamb. And the city had no need of sun or moon to shine on it. For the glory of God is, is its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations all walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. People will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will enter it, nor anyone who practices abomination or falsehood, but only those who are written into the Lamb's book of life. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bringing bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the streets of the city. On either side of the river is the tree of life, and it's, and it's 12 kinds of fruit, producing each fruit, producing its fruit each month. And the leaves of the tree are from the healing, are for the healing of the nations. Nothing accursed will be found there anymore. But the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and his servants who worship him. They will see his, they will see his face, and his name will be on, on their foreheads. And there will be no more night. The need, they need no lamp or sun. 
for the Lord God will be their light and they will, and they will reign there forever. Good morning. Good morning. And thank you for inviting me. It is a pleasure to be here. This is, I suppose, my first semi-official act as the General Presbyter of Albany, and I look forward to a rich and fruitful relationship in mission and ministry with you. I'm also really excited to be here on a Sunday when you are preparing for church camp, because that was absolutely foundational in my life and in my son's life, and I hope that that will be the case for folks who are going there for the first time. So we start this morning on a mission trip. Paul, Timothy, and Silas are doing the work of spreading the gospel in what we today call Syria and Turkey. When Paul has a dream calling him to Macedonia, come and help us. Now, call narratives are integral to the Bible. They're those moments when God intervenes, gives direction, moves the action forward. They are those moments when folks are given a choice to participate in God's work in our world. And, of course, calls don't just happen to the great figures of our faith history. We are called all the time to be part of the work and responding to a call, it takes faith. The first of the Christian virtues that Paul mentions in his first letter to the Corinthians. Paul could have woken up and gone to Timothy and Silas and said, guys, you won't believe this crazy dream I had last night. And they could have responded by saying, yeah, Paul, that's weird. And that could have been it. But for a call to be realized, it has to be responded to. That takes faith. That commitment, that conviction that however strange and unexpected and inconvenient, God has chosen us to do some work. And they do respond. We immediately tried to cross over to Macedonia, being convinced that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them. And so they go on the strength of a dream and a belief that God was working on them and through them. And that brings us to another Christian virtue, the one that Paul lifts up as the most important, and that is love. Love is what we do in our various callings. It is the work of God in the world. It was love for the people of Macedonia that drove Paul and Timothy and Silas forward. It was love that prompted Lydia to open her house to them. When we respond to a call, we are accepting the responsibility to be God's love in the world. But this call, to Macedonia. This is gonna be a tough one. If we move on from our passage this morning, we immediately find these three guys in trouble. And soon we find them in jail. Now I hope your call never lands you where they land, but I cannot promise you that your call won't place you in some jeopardy or another. I can't promise you that your call will be unencumbered by doubt or even by despair. We do our work in the world and the world can be a weighty place. And that leads us to the third of Paul's Christian virtues. It's the one that tends to be ignored. We all get that centrality of faith. Faith is language that we understand. 
And we know that we are called to love, even if we don't always understand just how radical a call that is. But we sometimes forget the importance of hope. It's the middle child of the Christian virtues. And like many middle children, it must sometimes feel neglected. But folks, hope is the energy on which a call depends. Very few of us can labor for long where we have no hope. If we come to believe that our work has no purpose and that our call cannot ever bear fruit, it's next to impossible to see it through. Hopelessness is the enemy of discipleship. So as we live out that discipleship, it's important to keep before us a vision of what may be. It's important to remind ourselves that God's reality is not our reality and that through God, all things are possible. I think that's especially important for us today. I don't say uniquely important to us because it's been important to other people at other times, but it is especially important. We know that those who have come before us have lived in dark times and have faithfully carried out God's work in the midst of those times. But that can be small comfort when we feel our own wells of hope drying up. We live in a time and a place where hope seems in short supply, where hatred has inexorably become the rhetoric of our public life, where the fear of those not like us has been made into political capital, and where our flags seem permanently stuck at half-mast. And I want to acknowledge that. And I'm grateful to Heather for acknowledging it as well. I want to acknowledge that it can seem pointless to be the church in a time when our efforts seem ineffective. And when the things that we are supposed to value as followers of Christ seem to be valued so very little in the world around us. And that brings us to our second passage. In the book of Revelation, as I was preparing for this morning, I was reminded that Revelation was one of two books of the Bible that John Calvin never preached on. And believe me, I get that. Um, it is a fever dream of book and has been the source of so many fringe theologies and the inspiration for some of the darker moments in our shared history. It's a difficult book to get a handle on. And I was sorely tempted to give the reading a pass. But it does deserve our attention. And a little bit of background. Current scholarship is largely in agreement that this book, Revelation, was composed during the reign of the Roman Emperor Domitian by a man named John who had been imprisoned on the island of Patmos because of his religious beliefs. Domitian's reign is an important backdrop because after some, some inner turmoil in the Roman Empire, Domitian had promised to make Rome great again. And central to that vision was a religious policy that outlawed foreign practices as well as compelling the worship of traditional Roman deities. In this atmosphere, Christians, whose legal status had actually been a matter of some fluidity during the reigns of earlier emperors, were definitively cast as enemies of the state. Now, Revelation has often been read as a book of predictions, a mystical account of world history and the end of times. And I've never been comfortable with that reading. And I've really never been comfortable with the interpretations that it spawned. I don't see the book as a book of predictions primarily. 
I think it is rather an acknowledgement of the grim reality in the time that John was living. And certainly John doesn't pull any punches in calling out the evil of his day throughout this book. It is that, but it is also, and you need to hear this, it is also a message of hope for his fellow believers. Living through a time of hopelessness. John knew that this still young movement was at a crucial inflection point. And that giving in to despair, which would have seemed natural, would also be deadly. And so interlaced with his apocalypticism, with those weird visions of angels with flaming swords and scrolls sealed by seven seals, there are moments like our reading from this morning, moments of lyrical beauty suffused with a vision of God's kingdom. See, John is giving his followers the necessary energy to live into their callings, even given the real frustrations and disappointments, and in their case, dangers that threaten to overwhelm their daily reality. God's reality, John is saying, is a different and a greater reality. And while the evidence of the current day might lead us to toss in the towel, God has greater plans. And that vision needs to remain in front of us. Again, hope gives us the energy to be disciples. But it's important to acknowledge this about hope as well. By its very nature, the things we hope for have not happened yet. And they are not guaranteed. We hope for things that may be. And we use that hope to create a new world. Now, I'm convinced that nothing we do or don't do will get in the way of God's ultimate vision for God's creation. But I'm also convinced that the things we do or don't do have very real consequences in the immediate moment. And we have the power to heal or to hurt our neighbors in profound ways. As so I was thinking of, of John's vision, this vision we read together this morning of the coming commonwealth of God, I was reminded, and I don't really know why, of another very different vision. I want you to remember with me, if you know it, that scene in Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol when Scrooge is visited by the ghost of Christmas future. And as this ghost leads him through various visions of what may be, and the visions get progressively grimmer and grimmer, ending with Scrooge's gravestone, we see Scrooge gradually and then triumphantly embrace a new reality. When he comes to the realization that what he's seen does not have to be, if he can find a way to change himself. John's vision from this morning is, is sort of an inversion of that. It's a positive vision, not a negative one. But here's the connection. Just as the misfortunes that Scrooge sees do not have to happen, neither are we guaranteed to be the inheritors of that beautiful city from Revelation. We have work to do. And we cannot assume that someone else will do it for us, that we can just sit back and wait for the coming of the kingdom. We are not called to be spectators, but to be disciples. The hope that we hold as a gift from God is not intended to be a palliative. It's not a narcotic. It's not just a painkiller to get us through. It is the food to feed us. Amen. 
I want to leave you with this from the Talmud. I often hear it from my friends that are engaged in God's work for social justice in the world. And if it's not familiar to you, I invite you to, to take it into your hearts as a daily prayer. Do not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief. Do justly now. Love mercy now. Walk humbly now. You are not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. Amen. Our prayers this morning will be led by Gabriel Oforio Kai, who will be leading us from Zoom. Are you there, doctor? Yes, I am. Okay, thank you. You can hear me well. Okay. Thank you, Elder Rob, for the timely and important message. 
Let's join our partners in Ghana across the Atlantic Ocean in prayer. Uh, we thank God for Rob's uh, ministry and we ask for God's blessing for his work as the general presbyter of the Albany Presbytery in June, starting in June. Gracious God, we thank you for bringing us together again to worship you. Lord, hear our prayers. We pray for an end to gun violence, that there will be necessary legislation for gun control. We pray for the victims of gun violence. Good God, comfort the bereaved families and the loved ones. Lord, lead us to study, understand, and treat mental illness, a leading cause of gun violence. Almighty, Almighty God, it is not your will that over 200 mass shootings have taken place in this country since the beginning of this year. On May 14, an 18-year-old white supremacist murdered 10 black people and wounded three citizens at a supermarket in Buffalo, New York. We pray for the victims of the incident and comfort for the survivors. We also pray for the perpetrator that he might know you, O oh our Lord. We pray for members of the congregations who have been infected with COVID. Good God, fill them with your divine healing power. Gracious God, help us to understand the variants of coronavirus, which is making us incapable of lowering the infection rates around the world. We pray that the vaccines are made available to people in all parts of the world. And we pray for divine inspiration to develop better vaccines and pharmaceuticals. Good Lord, we pray for your peace in Ukraine. We pray for the millions of people who have left their homes to look for a safer place to settle. We pray for the helpers of the displaced. We pray that the host nations welcome the refugees and be their helpers. Good God, we pray for an end to violence and atrocities associated with wars. Almighty God inspired the peace negotiators in Turkey to come up with a peace agreement to end the hostilities in the Ukraine. We pray for our, our ministers, sessions, deacons, and Sunday school teachers and for all our congregations who are having surgery, are ill with cancer and other diseases, or who have health-related problems. We pray for your loving touch upon each and every one of them. We pray for the grace to enable us to the will to be witnesses of Christ unto others, may our lifestyle so shine before others that they may glorify God and seek to come to you, our Savior. We thank you, O oh God, that many privileges given to us in our lives as your children. We pray that you will continue to open doors of prosperity unto your children, even during these challenging times. Prayers of the people. The prayers of the people of our, are also our prayers, and the prayers of the partners are also our prayers. 
We pray for the victims of the severe weather conditions in the USA, especially the devastating effects of thunderstorms, flooding, tornadoes, and wildfires in this country. Ghana is also experiencing severe rains, thunderstorms, and flooding. Good law teaches us to stop the abuse of fossil fuels, which is leading to the climate change. We pray for the spirit of perseverance to overcome the trials, challenges, and temptations of today's world. May we be triumphant in our daily battles with the enemy who keeps luring God's children with worldly desires. Oh Lord, bless the fundraising efforts of the youth we are, who are accumulating money for a summer camp. Please touch the house of many, very many donors to give generously. Our Lord bless the light clinic, a legal service clinic of Westminster and the focus churches. All this we ask in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, Gabriel. Well, I've reflected before on the many, many ways that we all give. In the uh, story from Acts today, we heard about Lydia, who opened her doors to the, uh, to the apostles. We saw Oscar and his, and his uh, sisters and his family raising money for sleepaway camp. Uh, and both of those, I think, are really essential things in our human lives. Hospitality is, is so key to everything we do. Giving a, a young person a chance to live in nature for a while uh, and form great bonds. I, I know that from our own children, how important that is. We all give in some way or other. Uh, I am here this morning to ask you again to remember this church as part of your giving, uh, as part of your community, as part of the essential nature of who we are. Uh, we make it so easy to give these days. Uh, there's a plate in the back for those of you who are here in the room. Uh, the website makes it really easy. Uh, so please remember, uh, if you are a, if you've pledged, please make your pledge. Or uh, and if it hasn't, you can easily donate. Uh, and also, please come and drink lemonade this afternoon. Thank you.
friends, go from this place assured that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit will be with you, with us this day and forevermore. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.